Without a doubt, grains can be part of a healthy diet. Weston Price, who was a dentist in the early 1900s, explored two groups of people in particular, the Gaelics, who got a lot of their calories from oats, as well as the Swiss in the Los Chento Valley, who got a large amount of their calories from rye bread. The thing is, all of these foods were prepared in traditional methods. The oats were soaked for five to seven days at a certain temperature in a certain type of water. The rye bread was naturally fermented over a period of days and baked in, in natural methods. And not only that, the versions of these oats and the rye were like heirloom, organic quality. What we're gonna do here today is we're gonna make einkorn sourdough bread. And einkorn is the original form of wheat. Uh, you know, there's variations on flour we have now. Flour is originally in the state of a berry. It's called, it could be a rye berry, it could be a wheat berry. And this berry is a very hard seed that's ground up and milled into flour. Yeah, screw the bread guys, let's eat some steak. I went downstairs and I just opened up some a bag of rye berries I had from like a year ago. They're probably actually almost bad now, but this is what the, you know, the wheat or the rye looks like before it's milled into flour. It's these very, very hard seeds that, you know, they're much harder to grind up than you would imagine. So uh, very, 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 uh, labor-intensive process. It's pretty crazy, you know. We take these seeds, we grind them up into like powder, we ferment them, and then we bake them. It's really, really interesting and process that's way outside of what nature intended, at least so it seems. I used to actually mill my own flour, but when I realized I wasn't making sourdough bread anymore, what's the point of having a $400 grain mill? And the whole process from start to finish is very labor-intensive. You have to imagine how many man hours are required to make a mill? How many man hours are required to harvest the wheat? At the end of the day, it was more something we did out of necessity and just to get these calories. And the overall net time invested versus caloric gain in a society is incredible. I mean, on an individual basis, of course, it's very low if you were trying to do this yourself, but that's why we settled into civilizations once we started harvesting grain. Here I have 100% or uh, whole grain einkorn sprouted flour and then here I have a regular all-purpose einkorn flour the difference is This flour is sprouted. It's supposed to increase the bioavailability of the vitamins and reduce the phytic acid content and The hold version removes some of the bran and most people might just say well doesn't the bran only have anti-nutrients so it's actually debatable on whether or not the whole grain flour is healthier than the not whole grain flour and most people do think that sprouted flowers are healthier, but sprouting grains isn't necessarily something that would have been possible in nature. We would have had to germinate the seeds, dry them out, and then mill them up. I don't think that would have happened. I think the most natural form of the bread would just be a 100% whole grain version, not sprouted, that's it. Uh, sourdough methods would have been very, very practical and usable, but Flatbreads were also used, you know, we didn't necessarily always ferment the bread. Maybe we just mixed flour with water. Uh, I, I don't, I've seen many, many like Nordic areas prepare flatbreads. So what I use this bread for is a replacement for my family's bread. I mean, my father still can't stay away from pasta and other bread, but uh, I gave this to my grandma. Hopefully she feels better eating this bread. It's just a way to reduce inflammation. The einkorn wheat is more digestible. And that's really the main thing. It's, the, it's a source of energy, it's a source of nutrition, and this bread is super duper dense. So uh, let's actually just look at, uh, I will show you guys how to make this, and I will also link a sourdough masterclass, which is a video that explains things much further in depth than I do uh, in the description. But uh, first I might as well show you the end result and what we're actually making today. So this is the, uh, this is the einkorn, this is the, hold wheat. This is the all-purpose wheat. Uh, it's very similar to Italian bread. I don't know how many of you Italians are out there, but it tastes exactly like Italian bread. Slight sourdough flavor. Very, very plain. Uh, you know, this you can have with pasta, with, you know, as a sandwich bread. Uh, that's what you would use this bread for. What the purpose is it's still an excellent source of calories and I'm pretty sure I could beat someone with this. Like, this is like a, this is like a brick. You know, the, the, this is a very, very dense, nutritious bread. And I read a, uh, I watched a video on a Roman soldier diet 
And this is kind of the bread the Roman soldiers would have almost eaten, uh, probably the whole grain version, but it's very, very dense in nutrients and calories. And once you make that loaf of bread for the day, you can get a fair amount of your calories from it. This is the sprouted whole grain bread. Still same density, it's just smaller because I made a half the size of the loaf. Uh, the grain, the crumb profile is still similar. Uh, Oh man, this one is so, this is so nutty. It's almost sweet. It has this deep, complex grain flavor. Although this bread would re remind you more of Italian bread, I think this bread is just, this bread is delicious on its own and in general. It is by far, it's so delicious. I would, I would never make that other white bread. Like, but the only reason I made that was to be more approachable for my family. But this bread, I prefer 100%. You know, you can see the darker color. Whether or not it's more nutrient dense, it certainly tastes better on its own. So that's definitely something to consider. Uh, so let me show you guys how to, I, mean, I wanted to show you this first and go over the flavor profile. Uh, my dad loved both of these and he's a breadaholic. So uh, just showing you guys <laughs> that I can actually make the bread before you, you listen to me and we make it. Uh, to make bread, we need a yeast, a starter culture. And the natural way to do that is to take flour and water in equal parts and you pretty much let that sit for a week or two and the wild yeast in the air will start to ferment the flour and the water. And you keep adding flour and water and feeding the yeast. And then you like, you remove some of the starter, you add some flour and water back in just so you don't have to keep feeding it so much because it gets to a certain size. And I already have the starter done. So uh, here is a, this is the whole wheat starter. And this is just the regular, the white flour starter. And I just fed this one this morning. So this should be ready uh, to make some bread uh, within a couple hours. It's bubbling. I don't know if you guys could see the bubbling, the yeast. This one, the, the whole wheat starter is, I don't have enough to make another whole wheat loaf. Oh, it's like, it's like super sour, super whiny, yeasty smelling. And the reason I, I brought out two starters to show you guys is because depending on the grain and you know what type of uh, nutrients are in the grain, even if they're both wheat, uh, different yeast will take hold and produce different flavors. If you have a rye starter, I've noticed that rye bread has a much sweeter smell in, with the yeast and taste compared to wheat. Wheat has more of like a sour, acrid taste. Very, very interesting. I wonder if you could even use like what would happen if you used a rice starter and a wheat sour? You know, there's many, many variations uh, to sourdough bread. I mean, maybe one yeast would just take over, but who knows? So all we, we're really gonna do now, I'm probably gonna wait a couple hours just to make sure that that starter culture is nice and active, and then we're gonna make the bread. Uh, in regards to equipment you need, uh, everyone's gonna have pretty much the basics. I mean, what will make it easier, like I have a stand mixer that I'm gonna use to knead the dough for like 15, 20 minutes. That's gonna save a lot of effort on my part. And, and then we just need like a pot that has a tight fitting lid to, to cook the loaf in. So most people will, you know, you don't need proofing baskets. You don't need uh, bread baking loaf, loaf tins. You don't need those things that most bakeries that produce these breads in bulk use. And I guess one more thing to touch on is there are many variations on preparing bread. I mean, there's depth mold or rye method, there's different methods to produce different flavor profiles of bread and, and rise it in different ways, as well as preparations for every grain. If there's a grain or a source of plant in nature, a wild plant, a grain, whatever it is, there's usually a traditional method that's tied into preparing that grain to reduce the anti-nutrient content, to reduce the phytic acid content. Uh, oxalates, I don't know how much they could be reduced, but you're basically making the food less inflammatory and more digestible uh, the longer you ferment it and through various processes. So that's why we do this. We just want a source of energy that's less inflammatory. All right guys, first step to making the bread. I actually have my starter here in hot water uh, just to make it a little more active. Yeast is more active at higher temperatures, but it's good to go right now. In this bowl right here, I mixed it earlier by accident because I didn't think I had to refilm this video, but this is 800 grams of the white flour we have, 460 grams of water, and 10 grams of salt. That's all that we have in this bowl. 
And again, the recipe as well as the other video as a full guide on how to do this will be posted below. So the only thing that we have to add in addition to the flour, the water, and the salt is of course the fermentation base. And this is just a natural way to replace the yeast. So we need 320 grams of the fermentation base. And I might do a little more because it is a little bit wet. Usually this, the mother starter you use is equal parts flour and water. This is a bit more. So maybe we'll go to 350 grams of starter. Now this starter, if you want to use it, you know, keep it on the counter, keep feeding it, or put it back in the fridge. That's what I'm going to do. Now comes the more laborious part, where we have to knead this dough for about 15-20 minutes in order for the gluten structure to build, as well as the elasticity in the dough. Uh, so it rises and it keeps its crumb. Now, this, you know, very, very labor intensive, but you still get a net caloric gain. I fortunately have a stand mixer, otherwise I wouldn't be making bread for my family every other day. So again, guys, this is going to go for about 15 minutes and then we'll come back down and we'll check the texture. While the mixer is kneading the dough, I put the bottom oven on a warm temperature just to warm it up so we can proof the yeast at a higher temperature. If it's like 85, 90 degrees outside, you don't have to do this, but as long as the oven is below 130 degrees, the yeast will not die. Our bread has been going for like 20 minutes. And if when we stretch the dough, it doesn't tear. It's like a window pane effect almost. So, and this this dough hook is very is almost hot, and the dough is very warm itself because of the uh, the heat from the friction of the kneading. So that's that's good. It'll stimulate the yeast growth a lot more. We don't have to worry about the dough being cold. Okay, now this goes in a warm oven to proof for three hours. And I just put a damp towel on top of that so the top doesn't dry out. Not too important. For our baking vessel, all I did was I traced the bottom of the pot we're going to use on some parchment paper. I'm going to cut this out and put it in the bottom just so it doesn't stick. All right, so our dough has proofed for about three hours. Uh, as we could see, you know, there's a lot of air in it. We got to kind of knock it back down. Okay, so now that we knock the air out of the dough, it's going to go into the final baking vessel, which for me is the pot that has a tight fitting lid and some parchment paper on the bottom so it doesn't stick on the bottom. Switch to a bigger bowl. The one might have been a little too small. All right, so the bulk of the work is done. Now this just has to go back into that warm oven to proof for another three hours. I put the oven on the lowest heat for just like a minute and then I just let it sit. Especially in the colder months, this speeds things up a lot. Oven at your hottest temperature for 10 minutes. Then you put the bread in. Ideally, you score the top with the razor blade. I'm gonna go grab one. Razor blade. I'm just gonna make a few designs in the, in the dough. And in some, in some civilizations, they used to have like stamps. So you know which bread was yours. This needs a lid so that it steams itself. If it doesn't have a lid, a crust is gonna form on the top before the bread gets to rise. A loaf this size takes about an hour in this hot ass oven. So in about 40 minutes, we'll take the lid off and let it brown on top. didn't rise as much as I would have liked to, but that's probably because the pot was so big. I'm gonna let this cool off and we'll check on it in the morning. 
All right, guys, so it is the next morning. Uh, we got a ni really nice crumb profile on this loaf. Uh, very dense, soft in the middle, smells like the Italian bread, you know. Crumb profile looks awesome. Very happy with how this turned out. This is actually one of the better crumb profiles that I've had on the bread. Usually they're a little denser than this. But uh, that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, as I said earlier, there are many, many preparations in regards to various grains. And, you know, when people ask me, is one grain better than another? That's a very individual question to answer. I mean, obviously something like white rice or wild rice or whatever might be a lot less inflammatory than wheat for some people. So the reason I don't like answering if something is better or worse is because people ate these foods out of necessity according to their region. Now, if we were gonna debate these things up and down, say, all right, is there, is there a pollution factor in rice, maybe arsenic, you know, who knows? There's just too many variables. And the point is that the initial food is high quality you can tolerate it, particularly, you know, maybe it's part of your ancestry, maybe it's something they've eaten for the past thousands and thousands of years. But by no means were these foods we would have consumed to be in optimal health. Granted, they were more than like 30 to 40% of our calories. That's why, I, you know, Italians are a lot shorter than other people. We had a heavy grain and plant base to our diet that did not have a lot of animal foods. There needs to be a certain amount of animal foods in the diet to sustain like optimal height, you know, every, every, all those factors. So uh, if you guys would like to support me, please just share the video. Uh, the wheat flours that I used in this video are actually on my Amazon shop if you want to check that out. Uh, I'll also add some other, I'll add some other wheat and stuff uh, to my Amazon shop, some other rye grains, some other things. Uh, if you guys would like to support me, please just share the video. And outside of that, you know, you can check out my website, prank-stefano.com. Uh, if you guys are interested in reaching out to me for anything, you can also shoot me an email in the description below, frankatufano at gmail.com.